Hola amigos, coming up in this episode we have The Copper Man. Having his tools right beside him gave archaeologists a valuable insight into how mining was done. What a breathtaking view and just wait till I zoom out. And as you can see, only the walls remain. All the timbers and iron, they've all been scavenged long ago. So I'm in the town of Colama in the far north of Chile. Colama is a mining town that really only exists to service the huge Chuquicamata copper mine a few kilometers to the north. I heard there were free tours, so I made my way to the tourist office. The lady there put me on a collectiva to the actual mine site office in the town, where we were shown a short video and asked to sign a disclaimer. Given construction, hard hats, they checked that we had long sleeves and uh, proper closed shoes. The tour was free, but they actually asked us to donate some money to this children's charity. If you scrutinize the second paragraph there in English, it's obvious that they do, really do, need help with translations. So then we're on a bus barreling down the service road to the now abandoned town of Chukikamata. When we got out of the bus, they showed us this Art Deco theater. The guide said it was an exact replica of an Art Deco theater that exists in the USA. And this white building with a sign dating to the year 2002. I couldn't help wondering if Andrea and Che Guevara, who I mentioned in episode 15, would have been inside some of these buildings. Just to jog your memory, my father is a geologist and he was chief in operation of a huge copper mine in Chukicamata. But my father's boss, he got killed after that. But it was at the time when Andrea's father was the chief geologist. Fidel Castro made a point of visiting the Chukicamata mine and there's a photo of him there. You might recall that Chukicamata copper mine features in a dramatic scene in the film The Motorcycle Diaries. This copper mine is so deep and so rich, it has earned the majority of Chile's foreign exchange over the years, and therefore always has and always will be a political battlefield which you could write a book about. There was a small on-site museum and inside there was a newspaper dated to 1970 saying Kalama had yet to wait another five years before it got an automated telephone exchange. But I wonder if that ever happened on time because in 1971 AN they nationalised the mine and in 1973 Pinochet's long-lasting military dictatorship took over. Another interesting exhibit was this LP vinyl record distributed by the US Information Service perhaps because for more than 50 years this mine was owned by American interests. In fact, it was the Guggenheim brothers who greatly facilitated its development by bringing in steam shovels left over from the excavation of the Panama Canal. Between these two symbolic lines, we have a geological fault. And all the copper that we can found is magmatic, or lithium magmatic. They also had this sign depicting El Hombre de Cobre, or the Copper Man, the mummified and mineralized body of a pre-Hispanic native miner, whose cadaver was found here in 1899. He was just one of four mineralized mining mummies found in this area over the last hundred years. And the surprising thing is, one of them was a woman. But getting back to the Copper Man, the most famous mining mummy, he was found in a crevice with his clothes and mining tools intact. He'd been caught by a cave-in, trapped and died. Having his tools right beside him gave archaeologists a valuable insight into how mining was done for hundreds, if not thousands of years, before the Spanish arrived with their gunpowder and changed the whole method of mining. His corpse was brought out, photographed, bought and sold a few times and finally sent to the United States, where it was displayed at the 1901 Pan American exhibition in Buffalo, New York. His body was displayed in the Chilean pavilion and crowds were so eager to see him that the glass case holding him smashed by all the people pressing up wanting to get a closer look. The Copper Man was put on display from May to November in 1901, which means he was there when the United States President McKinley was shot and assassinated in the nearby music temple. After that, the Copper Man was seized by creditors in true American style, sold to J.P. Morgan, who donated it to the American Museum of Natural History. Forensic tests performed on him in the 1950s showed he had not suffered any broken bones, although he was missing a toe and a finger. He also had a flattened skull, a custom common in the Andes that I'll talk about in another episode. His green colour came from the copper salts, which slowly but surely, as his body dried out, it absorbed these copper salts in a process called pseudomorphism. Pseudomorphism Morphism has been observed in other situations, such as this completely copperized scorpion found in a mine in Arizona. 
Forensic tests ascertained the copper man died around the 6th century AD, or CE as we say now. Around a thousand years later, when the Spanish conquistador Pedro de Valdivia was embarking on his conquest of Chile from Cusco, his horses were suffering badly from a lack of horseshoes. Jerónimo de Viva, a witness to these events, wrote how their horses' horseshoes were so worn out they decided to just ride out and try and find some copper found some and found enough to smelt horseshoes and stirrups in a pretty short period of time. The same chronicle speaks of abundant silver and copper in this area and how native women used copper charms and adornments for witchcraft and other things. Fast forward to the 21st century and construction workers excavating for a new metro in the capital Santiago found a skeleton that had buried at his feet a copper horseshoe. And then things get even more intriguing. Chemical analysis of the copper smelted by pre-Hispanic peoples demonstrates a very advanced knowledge of metallurgy. So advanced, they cannot work out what process they used to produce it. It's still unknown. And now, modern Chilean manufacturers sell copper alloy horseshoes, which they claim last longer, are more shock-absorbing, they're non-slip, and not only that, the copper has antimicrobial properties, which is kind of like an antiseptic that stops the horses getting infections through their hooves. The company is actually part-owned by Cadelgo, who own Chucky Kamata Mine. Back out in the hot tropical sun, we waited for the bus to pick us up. These buildings are all slated to be demolished. The ever-growing spoil heaps will eventually engulf them. You can see just how close they are here. The order to abandon was given a few years ago due to dust contamination. And there was plenty of evidence of that when you look at the back of these trucks. Finally, we were on a bus heading to the designated viewpoint on the main pit, and we got a glimpse of just how enormous this pit is. Pit mine has five kilometers long, three kilometers wide, and one kilometer deep. We have the view area. Don't take off your helmet, please. We are going to be here just 10 minutes in case of earthquake the left side of the bus is the same. This grandstand-type viewing platform was specially built for visitors so they could just get an idea of how huge this place is. What a breathtaking view and just wait till I zoom out. It was once the largest in the world. It's only recently been pipped by La Escondida, a neighbouring Chilean copper mine. That must be the great-great-grandson of the Panama Canal steam shovels. <laughs> This mine is so huge, one of the biggest in the world, that they have a traffic control tower that looks like it has a lot in common with an air traffic control tower of a busy airport. <laughs> the copper is crushed and then extracted by a leaching process on site. The guide said each of these copper plates is 99% pure and weighs 135 kilograms. They have two types of trucks. The smaller ones can haul 330 tons, the bigger ones can carry 400 tons. Those huge trucks must represent a huge capital investment. Oh man, look at that black exhaust. But it's interesting to note that the leftist Salvador Allende nationalised these mines in 1971. It was a big factor in the overthrow of the government by the right-wing Pinochet regime, but it has remained government-owned ever since 1971. Pinochet never privatised it, and it has earned the people of Chile a lot of money over the years. This pit has been mined with modern equipment for almost a century, and it's estimated it will last another century at current rates of extraction. So you can expect this immense hole in the ground to get even bigger. All too soon for me, we were heading back into town. Those snow-covered peaks profile can be seen almost perfectly reflected in the clouds above them. We are in the high desert here. Chukikamata town is in an altitude of almost 3,000 metres. Those mountains must be even higher. Back in Kalama, I saw this conspicuous mural. On the right-hand side, there was a painting of Salvador Allende and a quote of his about Chukimata being belonging to the people. And as I said in episode 15, he committed suicide in 1973 with a machine gun gifted to him by Fidel Castro. Then on the left-hand side, there's a portrait of the communist senator Pablo Neruda, who also won a Nobel Prize for Literature. He also died in 1973, which obviously was a tumultuous year in the history of Chile. But politics in this town wasn't restricted to men. Look at the front page of the newspaper regarding International Women's Day the other day. <laughs> 
So I've now been on the road for 25 days since I left Cusco. I'm running a little bit behind schedule if I want to make it to Patagonia in time before the cold weather comes in, but I keep seeing interesting things to investigate, so what can you do? Anyhow, I packed my bags, packed my bike, left Kalama and headed southwest along this road trying to rejoin with the Pan American. This road generally follows the railway track which once serviced those 130 odd saltpeter processing plants, but now it services Chukikamata copper mine. I slowly caught up with this train which was carrying red cylinders, I don't know what it was for, and when I finally overtook it, I wasn't going much faster than it, uh, on the left there, there was this big white animita. Now some of these old saltpeter processing plants come right up to the road. This one's called Pampa Union. And as you can see, only the walls remain. All the timbers and iron, they've all been scavenged long ago. Then I turned right and headed north just a little bit because there was something I wanted to see. The Ex Oficina de Salitre Chacabuco. In 1971, Salvador Allende restored it and opened it as a tourist attraction, but that didn't last very long because just two years later, when Augusto Pinochet took power, he started filling it with political prisoners. In effect, it became a concentration camp. And as you'll find out in the next episode, the tragic history of this place still haunts Chile, quite literally. I thought he was joking when he said, be careful which way you ride out of here because the camp is surrounded by landmines. Then I checked on Wikipedia and there's 98 of them still unaccounted for. Finally out of the tropics and into the temperate zone. There it is, the hand of the desert in the middle of nowhere. Well, my first night camping since I was a kid. What was that? <laughs>